Well, thank you again, everybody, for your interest. And now we'll switch gears slightly to talk about the other F word. So steering clear of falls this winter as well. And I'm going to focus at least certainly more towards the end on strategies to reduce falls and really reduce your vulnerability and preserve vitality. So to begin with, did you know that one in three adults over the age of 65 fall each year? Half of this group will fall more than once. And unfortunately, the large majority of hip fractures are due to falls. And one in five seniors with hip fractures will die within a year of the fracture. Falls can lead to fear of falling, functional decline and loss of independence, and nursing home placement. And after all that doom and gloom, I think the most important point of this slide is that they don't have to. And really, um, this is just as Dr. McElhaney showed in her previous slide. There certainly are risks, there certainly are challenges, but there are also many ways that you can take things into your own hands to be able to age well, to live well, and to prevent as best as we can some of these outcomes that we all wish to avoid. So as I thought I would start with a question about what do we need to stay on our feet? That's what the title is hiding behind that uh, marker up there. And overall, I think hopefully you'll come to the conclusion that I have that it really involves coordination of multiple body structures and functions. We used to think of walking as very much an automatic movement that we don't normally need to think much about, although it does take usually a good full first year of our life to figure out how to do it in the first place. So really to walk, you need some rhythmic movements. You need to be able to keep your balance and you need to be able to navigate where you're going. And really, it involves just about all of our body's main structures and organ systems. I think first and foremost, we need to have good sensory input. And obviously, our eyesight is very relevant to that. Um, in particular, two vision functions, your depth perception, so ability to figure out you know, how far off that curb when you're stepping are important, and also something called contrast sensitivity, which is your ability to be able to distinguish between different shades of gray to be able to see that crack in the sidewalk, for example. Other sensory functions are involve our inner ear, so our vestibular system, because that senses movement, rotation, and displacement. And then also, we need our peripheral nerves to tell us about touch, temperature, and especially our position of our arms and legs in space. And then all of that needs to be integrated, and that's where our central nervous system is so important. And I'll come back to that in a bit, but pretty much every level of the nervous system is very important for walking. And that's why just about, if you would think, just about every neurologic disease can potentially increase your fall risk. And then obviously we need intact bones, joints, ligaments to support our muscles, a good delivery system with an intact cardiovascular system, and good lung function. So it really does cover a lot of aspects of remaining healthy and well. I just want to spend a little bit more time, again, just talking about how important our brains are for fall prevention. I think this is an area that is really, um, it, it's been recognized for a long time that people with cognitive impairment are at increased risk for falls. But I think it's certainly a new area of investigation, just figuring out what aspects are involved. And I, and I think in particular, there's uh, our ability to be able to organize multiple cognitive functions that's important. Um, to be able to make decisions on the spot, to be able to focus your attention, to be able to shift your attention, to be able to have good judgment and insight and assessment of your surroundings. So these are all areas of great interest and I've actually been part of a study of home exercise that has actually shown that exercise can improve some aspects of these functions and reduce falls as well. So you'll certainly hear me pitching exercise um, as we go along and I think it's probably one of the most important things that we can do um, to be able to reduce our risk of falls and other health issues that can be associated with aging. So the other main point I'd like you to take away with you is that falls are not accidents. So often in the Falls Clinic, I hear patients describe this, that it was a one-off. It caught me by surprise. It was just an accident. 
But really, I'd like you to think of falls as a bit of a tip of an iceberg that really should get your attention, get your health provider's attention, that there's something, there could be something going on that led this person to be vulnerable to a fall at that time. We all navigate uneven sidewalks or are doing multiple um, complex tasks that might throw us off our balance. And most of the time, I like to hope we're not falling. Um, but the trick is to figure out when a person is functioning at the limits of all of those systems that we talked about, where there is no further reserve to accommodate an acute illness like the flu, or a medication side effect, for example, or some other situation. Um, so really, it's about a balance um, between your own reserves and whether you're functioning on empty or whether you've got lots of fuel in the tank for your various different systems functioning and the amount of insult that gets you. I mean, we'd all be knocked over by a Mack truck, but there are sometimes smaller challenges that can throw us off. So the goal, I think, really in geriatrics and particularly for fall prevention is to try and make sure that your reserves are as good as you can have them be. And there's no reason for you to wait until you see a geriatrician. You can start working on that yourselves. So the other important thing along with that is the more risk factors a person has or the more things that aren't working at quite 100%, the more vulnerable you will be to having a fall. Okay. So I'm just going to quickly go through some examples of risk factors for falls. And they really relate again to that first explanation. Um, there are intrinsic risk factors, so health conditions to, that we would have, medications we're taking, extrinsic risk factors that are in our environment, and then situational factors as well that might be uh, something unique um, to a certain uh, time when a person might fall. So our intrinsic factors are age-related changes in physiologic functions, and we've heard one example from Dr. McElhaney about our immune function. Um, decreasing in its effectiveness as we age. Um, certainly you're probably, you may be familiar with decreases in some vision functions as you get older. We can sometimes see decreased reaction time. There can be decrease in muscle strength, although I would still argue that a lot of that has to do with a use it or lose it piece and we might see greater muscle strength for people who remain physically active. The other important thing is you can imagine there are a whole host of health conditions that can contribute to so really anything that reduces your reserves, either acute or chronically, can contribute. And then I want to emphasize also an important role of medications. Any medication, the more, the more of them that you're on, can be associated with fall risk. So more than four medications are associated with risk for falls in a linear fashion. And specific medications have also been culprits. So the one I want to really highlight are sedatives. Those are medications used to either treat anxiety or in particular to treat insomnia. When you're having trouble sleeping, physicians may also may often prescribe uh, a medication to help you sleep. And I'm so sorry to say that there is no medication used for sleep out there that does not increase your fall risk. There are other medications that can act on the brain or lower blood pressure and contribute to dizziness when you stand up, and those can be associated with fall risk. And in addition, alcohol, particularly in excess, so we think of more than seven units per week, seven to nine for women, and more than 14 in a week for men, can also contribute in various um, different ways. So the extrinsic factors are ones that you might be able to come up with on your own as well. Anything that's a challenge on walking surfaces, so that can be uneven ground, slippery, wet, rainy, leafy sidewalk, snowy, icy surfaces like last winter, and certainly support structures as well. Obstacles are certainly a challenge. I can think of a patient in the fall clinic today who had been doing remarkably well, but she got up in the night to close a window and just happened to bump into a chair, and that was what caused her to lose her balance. And along those lines, lighting levels as well. So those are some examples, but there certainly are others. And then situational factors. I actually find these quite fascinating because you know, every other day you might walk along the same sidewalk and do quite well, but perhaps it's the day when you're recovering from the bout of the flu, 
or you've just started a new medication, or you're extra tired from some other reason, and it's just affected your vulnerability where it just takes your reserves down that notch that you may be more susceptible to a fall. So this is where attention and judgment can be really important, and your assessment of your own physical capabilities, or when you're doing competing tasks, can think of you know someone picking up the recycling, turning around to lift something else, and it's the combination of those things that threw this person off that caused them to fall. Fear of falling is also another really important factor as well. I don't know if you've ever undertaken any sort of physical pursuit where you've been a little bit nervous about it, and you've noticed that you're not as relaxed or fluid or smooth in how you do it. That's what fear of falling can do to an individual when they're going through the activities of their day-to-day -day life. I can think of my own, my own analogy, I think, was probably from mountain biking, that I had fallen so much that I was petrified of falling yet again, and it really affected my ability to ride my bike as I knew I was able to. So it's that kind of experience that happens in a really important day-to-day -day task. And then cautiousness and risk tolerance. I think when we get a bit concerned is when there's a mismatch between a person's physical abilities and their assessment of themselves. We're concerned if people are not confident enough and not pushing themselves to you know, reasonable limits of what they're capable of. But we're also concerned if a person is not aware of their deficits and is speeding along without good care to what's going on. So part of that is, again, achieving a balance. I think the other important message for you to know is that falls definitely are preventable. And I've given you a list here of successful approaches. There's been a lot of work done looking at progressive strength and balance exercise programs. Overall, I would recommend to you that any exercise is better than no exercise. We know that physically active older adults are less likely to fall, are less likely to injure themselves when they fall, are much more likely to recover from their injuries if they do fall. So if I can pass one message along, it would be to really look, about, look at how you can work ways to remain and become more physically active in your day-to-day -day life. Now when we're thinking about specific exercise, the best bang for your buck is anything that will increase your leg strength, so really strength exercises, and also anything that improves your balance and agility. So that's why exercise such as Tai Chi has been so successful, or any other balance training programs, osteofit exercise programs that are offered at community centers throughout the Lower Mainland have been shown to reduce fall risk and bone density too. And um, any other even individualized program. So when my patients ask me about swimming, I would encourage them to keep on doing something that they love because you're much more likely to get out the door and do something that you enjoy. But whether, but will it reduce their fall risk the same as Tai Chi or some of these other exercises? The answer is no. But something is definitely better than nothing. The other really important thing that can be done is to stop psychotropic medication. So those are medications that act on the brain, in particular the sedatives. And another example of that would be even the over-the-counter sleep aids that often contain an antihistamine that can be quite sedating and can affect fall risk as well. Um, and there is some small but very good study evidence to show that falls can be reduced when patients are off these medications. The other um, accessible and very helpful thing that you can do is consider vitamin D supplementation. I don't know how many of you have heard about, well, there's certainly been a lot more interest in the news recently related to vitamin D for various health issues. And certainly I think it's been well recognized that it can reduce fractures. But one of the ways that it likely reduces fractures is not just through its action on the bones, but actually action on muscle. Did you know that vitamin D can actually promote muscle strength? This is the one thing that I can prescribe that does not rely on you having to change your lifestyle or your habits other than take a tablet. So what's been shown is that actually doses of 700 units a day or greater have been shown to reduce falls by about 20%. Um, and that's comparable to many other 
more complicated interventions. So again, that is something that's quite accessible. Generally, vitamin D is usually quite well tolerated. You, uh, unless you have other health issues that might predispose you, um, it, you would have to take an awful lot before you would have the side effect of raising your blood calcium level to a, a dangerous degree. The other thing that's been found to be helpful is that if you are diagnosed with cataracts and recommended for surgery, getting it done sooner than later is actually effective and can reduce falls, both for the first cataract and the second cataract. And the other one that you may or may not have been aware of is to change your multifocal lenses. If you look around at your friends and colleagues, most people tend to wear the graduated lenses or the bifocal or multifocal lenses. And all other things being equal, people who wear those lenses are far more likely to fall than people who do not. And just recently this summer, we finally got some study results that actually looked at changing the lenses to just single distance lenses for walking. And this reduced falls by about 40%, particularly in people who are over 80 and for people who are walking outside. So that's another compelling thing when you're up for a glasses prescription renewal is to think about separating your glasses. Because you, you know, um, when you're looking through the lens, it's really in that meter that's in front of you, um, which is where you need to kind of look through the gradient uh, between the lenses. So that can really lead to blurring, which can be important when you're going downstairs or navigating those important paces just in front of you. So the other thing that can be helpful is a home safety assessment by an occupational therapist. And this has been, th what this would involve is a review with you of how you go through your day-to-day -day life in your home with particular focus on your bathroom, but really all areas of your house. And you can access this by um, asking your physician or going to your local health unit to ask for a referral. The main benefit of this has been shown in people who have decreased vision and also people who have just recently been discharged from hospital or people who are having multiple falls within their home. So some specific things, and some of this is a bit of repetition, things you can do to reduce your fall risk, again, I cannot say it enough, is to exercise, exercise, exercise. You will make yourself strong. You will sleep better. You will have better energy. Your mood will improve. You'll reduce cardiovascular disease. And you'll feel really proud of yourself as well. And you'll probably have a lot more fun too if you're able to engage your friends and if you choose, work something social into that experience as well. The other thing that can be so important for fall prevention and overall healthy aging is to ensure that all your health issues are optimally managed. And I just highlighted as a subtitle to reduce cardiovascular risk factors. This has not been studied specifically for fall prevention However, cardiovascular risk factors are very important for many health conditions that do contribute to fall risk, such as chronic kidney disease, stroke, peripheral vascular disease, and in particular, dementia. So if I could only emphasize even making sure you get your blood pressure checked and being on top of that with your healthcare provider, I think that would give you a good long-term investment for your efforts. Ask your physician to review your medications. Is there anything that you're on that you don't need anymore? Is there anything that you're on that could be potentially harmful or concerning in an older person, but you may have done quite well on it in your 20s and 30s? I certainly see that in patients where they may have been on something for 20 years, but they, people change and medication effects can also sometimes change in an individual. So it's always good to reassess. Avoid sedative medications. Treat or prevent vitamin D insufficiency. And I just wanted to highlight as well, I think it's a reasonable recommendation to encourage older adults to maintain at least 700 units of vitamin D a day from diet or supplements. But the other side of that too is at least to make sure that their vitamin D levels are up in a range that are associated with fall risk reduction. Um, and then avoid wearing multifocal or reading glasses while you're walking. So the next slide just highlights some of the things that we do here in the fall clinic at St. Paul's Hospital. And I think we do have the most comprehensive fall service available 
and I've got the luxury of being able to work with some wonderful colleagues from a number of different services and I really do think that makes a difference when we get a chance to work together. So obviously we're assessing and treating problems related to fall and fracture risk. That's the other thing too because osteoporosis used to be considered a side as a condition of its own and there was really very little awareness of the impact of falls on major fracture risk but things are changing and it makes perfect sense to really address these things together. We spend a lot of time reviewing and adjusting medications and we also have a program to support people who are tapering off their sedative medications because sometimes that can be a bit of a challenge. We facilitate goal setting for functional mobility for people to be able to return to activities that they may have given up and we also monitor gait, balance, physical performance, function, cognition, you name it, we're on top of it. And we'll individualize and supervise an exercise prescription in whatever form that you feel comfortable practicing that in. And we also involve a dietitian, a continence nurse, a neuropsychologist in consultation as needed. So that ends the, the information I wanted to present to you. And thank you so much for coming tonight.